Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today with me. My name is Renee Grant. I am a master's student at the University of Guelph from the Department of Animal Biosciences, working with Dr. Alexandra Harlander. Today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about my project, the role of flight feathers on the ability of egg-laying hens to access elevated resources in multi-tiered housing systems. When wild species of waterfowl, such as the eared grebe, simultaneously lose all of their flight feathers during an annual molt, this causes them to completely lose their ability to fly, so they need to walk and swim to get around. This is because there are groups of feathers that run along the outside of the wing called the primary and secondary flight feathers, which you can see here. These feathers are so important for flight that for some birds, the loss of only one is enough to result in flightlessness. And actually, repairing this missing feather through the use of techniques such as imping, where a new feather is glued into the hollow shaft of a missing feather, it can actually return flight ability to a bird. Okay, so we know that having intact flight feathers is important for flight. But chickens that are kept for commercial egg production, which we call laying hens, are commonly missing their wing feathers. This may be due to damage that happens as they move their wings against housing structures, resulting in abrasions, or due to a behavior known as feather pecking. As you can see in this video, feather pecking is a behavior in which one bird will pick at and pull out the feathers of another bird. It is fairly common to see birds pecking at each other, but it becomes problematic when birds continuously repeat the behavior, resulting in loss to large areas of the feather cover, skin damage, and in some flocks this can further lead to cannibalism. Feather pecking is a big problem as it is very common, with reported prevalences of 15 to 95% among egg laying hen flocks. So at this point, you may be wondering, why do laying hens need wing feathers? Do laying hens even fly? In Canada, many egg farmers are converting their laying hen housing into multi-tiered housing systems, an example of which you can see in this photo. These housing systems make use of vertical space by using a tiered system in which laying hens have to fly and jump between the tiers to access resources such as food, water, perches, and nest boxes. The system is great in that it allows laying hens the freedom to perform behaviors they are motivated to do, such as perching, dust bathing, and foraging, while also giving them opportunity to exercise and have social companions. However, in these systems, the ability to move up and down to different tiers is essential for hens to be able to access all resources, and also to escape unwanted behaviors from other hens. But what happens when a laying hen has damaged or lost wing feathers? Previous work by Stephanie LeBlanc and colleagues showed that laying hens with a poor wing cover spent less time perching than those with a healthy wing cover. They attributed this finding to the poor wing covering limiting the effectiveness of wing flapping as a balancing mechanism. This would suggest that laying hens need their wing feathers to properly balance and comfortably perch. But how important are the wing feathers for upwards mobility? To date, there are no studies investigating the role of flight feathers on the ability of laying hens to access resources on elevated tiers. Which brings us to our study. We wanted to know, does the loss of flight feathers impact the amount of time hens spend accessing elevated resources in a multi-tiered housing system? To answer this question, we distributed 120 adult laying hens, 60 brown feathered and 60 white feathered amongst 12 floor pens, with 10 hens housed in each pen and strains housed separately. Within each pen, we randomly assigned hens to one of three treatments. The first were the controls, whose flight feathers remained intact. The second were what we called the half clip group, in which we trimmed the primary flight feathers of both wings, and these are the 10 outermost feathers of the wing. And the last group was called the full clip group, in which we trimmed all of the flight feathers of both wings. We utilize this wing trimming technique as it is well known to be effective for domestic parrots as well as backyard hens to prevent birds from flying off and injuring themselves. The pens that hens were kept in were furnished with two elevated platforms, which were our elevated tiers, two perches, one that was secured to the side of an elevated platform, and a second one, which was at the highest point of the pen and spanned the entire width of the pen. There were two feeders and two nest boxes. One of each was either on the ground or attached to an elevated platform. In having the pen set up this way, it was our objective to determine how much time hens spent accessing the elevated feeder and nest box before and after we applied treatments. In order to measure the amount of time that hens spent accessing feeders and nest boxes in their pens, we utilized an RFID unit, which we acquired from Biomark, a company specializing in this technology. The RFID unit works via the use of antennas and pit ticks. 
Antenna is plugged directly into the RFID machine and work by detecting the presence of individual pit tags. When a pit tag is recognized as entering the field of the antenna, it will be recorded on a microchip on the RFID unit as a timestamp, and the machine will continue to record the presence of that pit tag until it is out of range. In using pit tags, we had to come up with a way in which the antennas would recognize the pit tags on each individual chicken, and we did this by securing the pit tags to chicken leg bands through the use of Gorilla Tape, steel-enforced epoxy, and elastic bandage. We sandwiched each pit tag between two pieces of Gorilla Tape. Once sealed, we secured the pit tag to the leg band with a layer of epoxy. Once that epoxy set, we then took a layer of elastic bandage and placed it along the inside of the band so that it was comfortable for the laying hens, and we secured that in place with more epoxy. And using this method, we were able to ensure that when a hen stepped onto an antenna, we would be able to record this event with the machine. The next thing we had to consider was antenna placement. As we wanted to record each individual hen's time at the feeders, we had to ensure that feed was directed to only one spot on the feeder where the antenna was attached. So, with the use of more Gorilla Tape and cardboard, we made a ring that altered the flow of feed to one spot on the feeder and a lid to sit on top so that laying hens could not just eat through the top. Two pieces of wood were fixed to the side of the feeder as a guide for where the hens were to enter to eat. That way, when hens wanted to eat, they would have to go to one spot on the feeder where the antenna was located and they would have to step onto it in order to eat. And that way we can ensure that we got a good recording. And you can see that here in the video. Nest boxes were simpler. As they were already individual nest boxes, we just placed the antennas inside the nest box, we covered it with some of the hen's litter, and that way, when a hen entered, we would be able to record her for the entire duration that she spent in there. Now, moving on to the timeline of our experiment, the schedule appeared as follows. We took our first RFID recording on week zero before we applied treatments. This was our baseline measurement. Directly after the first recording, all hens received their treatment. We then got a second recording two weeks after treatments were applied on week two, and this continued every two weeks over the course of eight weeks to give us four RFID recordings for each hen. At the end of the experiment, all of the raw RFID data was run through a script, and the output of that gave us the total number of milliseconds that a hen spent at a specific feeder or nest box, which we then converted into minutes. Then we took the total number of minutes that a hen spent at both the elevated and ground feeder to give us a total number of minutes spent at the feeders, and we used this to calculate the percentage of time a hen spent at the elevated feeder. We did the same for the duration spent at the nest boxes. We ran this data through SAS version 9.4 using a generalized linear mix model. Strains were analyzed separately as they did use elevated space differently, which we are about to jump into now. So just before we jump into the results, you are about to see a series of pie charts. These pie charts represent the total number of minutes spent at a feeder for each treatment group. The blue space inside the pie chart represents the percentage of time spent at the elevated feeder, and the orange represents the percentage of time spent at the ground feeder. When you see a single asterisk, it represents a significant difference of 0.05 or less, and two asterisks represents a significant difference of 0.01 or less. Differences shown are within treatment groups and are comparisons from week zero. Okay, so to begin, we will start with the percentage of time that white feathered hen spent at the elevated feeder. On week zero, before treatments were applied, you can see that for all three treatment groups, elevated and ground feeder usage was relatively even. Two weeks after treatments were applied, you can see that the control and half clip groups maintain the same even feeder usage. However, the full clip hens spent more than 40% less time at the elevated feeder than they had at baseline week. And interestingly, on week four and on week six, we see that these patterns of feeder usage we saw in week two remained the same throughout the rest of the experiment. For elevated nest box usage, you can see that on week zero, white feathered hens used the elevated nest box more than the ground nest box. Two weeks after treatments were applied, the control and half clip groups continued to use the elevated nest box the same as they had before. However, the full clip hen spent significantly less time there, and they started to spend more time at the ground nest box. And as the weeks progressed, the full clipped hens continued to spend less and less time at the elevated nest box with each passing week. So next, how did the brown feathered hens make use of the elevated resources? For brown feathered hens, elevated feeder usage was very minimal. These birds ate mostly from the ground feeder. Therefore, when we applied treatments to them, 
we did not see any significant changes to their pattern of feeder usage. And as the weeks went on, you can see that they continued to eat mostly from the ground feeder throughout the entire duration of the experiment. However, like the white feathered hens, the brown feathered hens also spent more of their time at the elevated nest box than the ground nest box. Two weeks after treatment application, both the half clip and the full clip group saw a huge decrease in the amount of time that they spent at the elevated nest box, and they were now spending more than 75% of their time at the ground nest box. And as we saw earlier, the pattern that we see here on week two remained in place for the rest of the trial. So what does this all mean? Well, results of our study found that clipping the wings of laying hens reduced the amount of time laying hens spent accessing resources on elevated tiers, and that brown feathered hens were affected by both the half and full clip treatment, suggesting they may have a lesser tolerance for wing feather loss and upwards mobility. Brown feathered strains of laying hens are heavier than white feathered strains, and a previous study using brown feathered hens by Provine and colleagues showed that brown feathered hens had two times greater wing loading than the chicken's close ancestor, the jungle fowl, meaning that these hens were heavier and they had less wing area to accommodate their mass, resulting in shorter bursts of flight. In addition to this, a study by Leon and colleagues showed that laying hens are already at their performance limit for low speed descendant flight, and that is when the hens had all of their wing feathers. So these results, along with ours, indicate that flight performance in laying hens is poor and that an intact flight cover may be more important for elevated resource access in laying hens than previously known. I just wanted to thank you all for listening to my talk today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and the rest of the talks, and I will be around for a question period if you have any questions, or feel free to send me an email at the email address listed on the slide here. Thank you.